Welcome back to NAVCOM State at Eastvale for episode two of the URT23 restoration and reactivation. So today what we'll go over is what I've done so far, which is kind of minimal. I've had a lot going on the last couple of weeks, but we will also go through the spare RF-130 amplifier that I have, or RF-110 amplifier that I have, and uh, take a look at the insides. So come along for the ride and let's get started. All right, so what we can see here from the front, not a whole lot has changed, right? So we still have our power supply, our RF-110A, RF-131, but I have added an R-1051. Now this 1051 is an older model. It's one of the original um, styles. You can tell because the Indicator lights, the ones that keep the dials lit up, they're on the inside. On the newer models, like this RT618, you had them on the outside of the, uh, the case so you can unscrew them. Like this one here, so it looks like this, it's unscrewed, and then what you get is a little bulb like this, a 28 bulb, and then it basically fits in. And then screws back on. So easy. You know what? Light burns out, takes you 10 seconds to change it. Light burns out on this, you have to assemble the whole front of the uh, uh, front cover in order to get them out. So, needless to say, this one doesn't have working lights. Eventually, I'll get in there and change them. Some of the other stuff I've done is I did apply rack bars to it to tie everything together. These were, I think it was $30 or so on Amazon. Uh, tie everything together so it doesn't slide around as you pull it. And you can see with that nice uh, Harbor Freight wood cart down there, it moves around fairly, fairly easy for something that weighs close to 500 pounds. I did tie it all together with ground strapping all the way down the line. I have a Extra one here that I will uh, tie into the ground rod I have outside the shack. I installed my 50 amp cable and I have all of the plugs and adapters. The only thing I have left to do is make the cable that goes from the RF-124 to the RF-110. Interesting to note is I did borrow one from the ship and it's clocked differently. On the ship, they're clocked at 3, and mine is clocked at 12, so I was unable to use this one, so I'll return that, but I did get all of the cables that I need right here, or the Amphenol connectors. Ended up getting them from PEI Genesis, but uh, everything I need for the cable that goes between the power supply and the amplifier, bought a uh, power plug for the pre-selector here. I have the wire, uh, bought this, this is 20 kV wire. I'll use that for the 2200 volt line. And then I bought uh, just a, a uh, five foot section of multicolor wire uh, that's 600 volt rated for the rest. Um, while I'm in there on a shack, I did add a couple of more plugs. So I had some uh, 315 for that also. So let's go over, I have a spare RF-110 Alpha that came with my hull. So let's take a look on the inside and see what we see. We'll take a look at the driver tubes, take a look at the finals, and we will uh, look over some specs for those. All right, so with this uh, hull I got from Sacramento, it came with a spare RF-110 Alpha. So as you can see, fairly clean. Got 26 hours on the filament. There's its voice right there, it lets you know it's running. It's a 400 hertz, 11,000 RPM cooling fan that pressure, puts pressurized air through the drivers and the finals. I'm weighing the whole thing down using a Model 28. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to open it and show you uh, because it is fairly heavy. So um, basically, let me get it open and let's take a look. So slides out. Pretty easy. It's 
Then you've got your uh, turret in here for tuning. And then in the back here, you have a, uh, you have your finals. Let's get her pulled out. So you can see the unit slides out, got some transformers. It's missing the plugs in the back, as you can see. Somebody decided they needed that Amphenol connector set more than I did, but luckily it's a spare. This is the same plug that you would see that goes on the back that would connect to the power supply, so it can be connected if need be. And then you have the business side right in here. These are the CX or 4CX 1500 ceramic EMAC finals. There's two of them. Uh, depending on the cooling that you have, it'll dissipate up to 1500 watts. And that is one specific reason why they have that 11,000 RPM fan. Now I have seen online, lots of people have asked if they can change that fan with something else, something that has the same airflow, but there's some Harris guys out there that say no because it's the speed that counts, not the total airflow. So as you can see, there are your drivers. Give you an idea. According to the specs, and we'll look at those in a minute, they weigh about three pounds a piece, and you can tell just by the size of my hand that they're pretty good size. Now this will flip on its side so you can service the bottom. Pull out the triggers here. I did it earlier, but uh, sometimes they're not too, too graceful to get out. So let's see if it will be uh, easy for me to get out for you to see or if I'm gonna have to stop the video. There, there we go. So here you go on the bottom, we've got some more transformers. There's the uh, driver transformer. And then right behind this panel, which we'll go ahead and take off, is your 8122 drivers. So we'll go ahead and take this off. And then we'll show you what the drivers look like from the inside. So once these are pulled, it comes right out. And there they are. Now these dissipate about 350 watts on their own, so you could actually make your own little linear amplifier if you needed to. So I'll get this put back together and let's take a look at some specs. The X1500B. It's a ceramic metal forced air cooled radial beam tetrode with a rated maximum plate dissipation of 1500 watts. It's low voltage, high current, specifically designed for exceptionally low intermodulation distortion and low grid interception makes it especially suitable for radio frequency and audio frequency linear amplifier service. So you can say, as you can see, it's got a 6 volt uh, heater with a 9 amp current, maximum of 11. Um, so it's a high current uh, heater, which requires a minimum of 3 minutes heat up time. And this amplifier actually has a delay that holds it uh, until it reaches that 3 minutes. As you can see, it's uh, maximum operating temperatures for the seals is 250 degrees Celsius, which at 9 amps at 6 volts, if you don't have airflow through it, you could probably reach that fairly quick. You know, here it is here. It says that uh, you know, it's 4.8 inches, and you saw the picture with my hand there, uh, you know, 3.37 uh, 7 diameter. So 27 ounces, so a little over a pound and a half, is it? Basically, 16 ounces to a pound, I guess. You know, dissipates, uh, or DC plate voltage is 3,000, screen voltage is 400, plate dissipation is 1,500. As you can see, depending on the amount of airflow is also what uh, dictates the plate dissipation. Uh, uh, to dissipate 1,000 watts, it needs 18 CFM at sea level, 24 at 10,000 feet. And to get the full 1,500 out of it, you need uh, 34 CFM at sea level and uh, 45 at... Uh, 10,000 feet and it does show you the pressure you need it needs uh, you know 0.23 inches of water drop in order to uh, get the cooling that it needs so 
And it says here, since the power dissipated by the heater represents about 60 watts, and since the grid plus screen dissipation can, under some conditions, represent another 13 watts, an allowance has been made in preparing this tabulation for additional 73 watts of dissipation. Um, you know, you can go look this up online. You know, this is a pretty, uh, pretty stout tube, um, you know, made for continuous duty. You know, operating from a uh, command ship such as a carrier, battleship, uh, even smaller ships uh, would have had the same transmitter. Um, just kind of shows its uh, stoutness that it had, and the amount of time and or length of time the Navy and other branches of service kept it in service. Uh, entered service in the late uh, '60s and continued in service into the 2000s. Two two beam power tube. It's very small, low cost, forced air cooled beam power tube designed for use as an RF power amplifier, oscillator, regulator, distributed amplifier, or linear RF power amplifier, and mobile or fixed equipment. So this is pretty much your jack of all trades tube right here. Um, it's fairly small. You know it. Uh, you saw it in the the bottom of the uh, RF one ten there. Um, but there's not a whole lot uh, of interesting stuff here. I mean, it also, plate voltage could be up to 3,000 when you're at 30 megahertz, 2,200 at 500 megahertz, so it's got a fairly wide range. Um, you know, it uh, it's uh, just your general run-of-the-mill everyday driver tube. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't looked up to see what else this was used in, but I imagine... Uh, it was used in other linear amplifiers that were out there too. Um, once again, you can look this up, uh, 8122 online. Um, not very big. It says it's 1.625 inches across. The total height is 2.26. Um, I don't have one out. I imagine it's, it doesn't weigh much more than maybe a half a pound tops. So look it up, and uh, if you want to see more information on it, uh, all the information that's out there.